Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, this is Paul Allison sitting in the dark in Western Pennsylvania. I'm out here with my parents. My father's having some uh, medical issues. But um, so I may or may not be able to be here um, much, but um, we'll see. And so far, my mother's bringing a lamp outside. Um, anyway, uh, funny things here. But uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have Howard Rheingold with us. We've been talking about your book, Howard, uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, Monica is ready to start this conversation. Um, go for it, Monica. Ooh, look. I like it. Sure. I'll well, say as I can. Jeff Lebo is here with, uh, from South Korea as well. Go ahead. Yes, welcome, Jeff, and thank you for, for filling in. Um, I, guess, I guess I have to start with this. Um, I first was acquaint, became acquainted with um, Howard. Um, my very first podcast that I ever listened to, um, I think it was 2009, and um, he was having a chat with um, Dean Chersky and Alec Kroos and Rick somebody. The, the thing that got me from that whole conversation is um, there was a point in there, and I think it was Dean that said um, something about the value of being together in a room. And that kind of spurred our experimentation over the, the next four years of, or three years of what is the value of being together in a room? And does this really change things up? And so in reading NetSmart, I geeked out all over it because it seemed to be, it seemed to be maybe a guide plan or, you know, of how do we do this where we can question the value of being together in a room instead of saying, you go here on Thursday at 11 and you go here, you know, and you're going to learn this. Um, so that's that's my um, first introduction to Howard and um, loved NetSmart. And then after that, I read um, Smart Moms. So um, how... Chris is the only one that hasn't talked yet, and, and then we'll go straight into Howard if, if you want to start asking questions. Okay. Um, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I, too, have read some of Howard's stuff, like, for instance, Smart Mobs. Okay. <laughs> and then there's Net Smart. So, you know, the word smart, I noticed, is in both um, books. So, <laughs> sure and, and, you know, like a tagline in, uh, in your video, uh, even about the book, is, you know, that mindful digital citizenship matters to you, me, and everybody. And so um, I'm curious to have Howard just start with, with that premise. And we can't hear you, Howard. Oh, shoot. Okay. Getting, he said he has an alternate mic, so he's grabbing the alternate mic. Yeah. And Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself while you're while he's grabbing that mic? <laughs> and your and where you are, perhaps. Sure, I will say a quick hello. I am in uh, Pusan, Korea, in class 401, surrounded by uh, a dozen elementary school teachers here, uh, and we spent the past hour discussing some net smart issues and and uh, computer usage here. And so they're going to be tuning in and who knows, maybe chiming in as we uh, have our conversation. Nice. If you guys just popped in, could you introduce yourselves? Christian, Fred, and Mariana. Okay, my name is Mariana. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. And um, hi, I'm 23 years old. My name is Christian. I'm from Bogota, Colombia too. I'm 22 and I'm studying engineering at the university. Hi, Valerie Burton from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm an English teacher. Fred Mendlin in Watsonville, California, and I'm the Associate Director for Technology Integration with the Central California Writing Project based at UCSC and also work in schools all over Santa Cruz County. And you have a great scarf on tonight. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that for Howard? I've been wearing this his, all the time. You trying oh, to really? keep it his fashion sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get complimented by the kids when I do my substitute teaching. 
It's good. I love it. So, Soy maestro bilingüe también. Oh, hablas español. Uh oh, we lost Howard. Sí. So, Chris, do you want to rephrase your comment or question to Howard and we'll jump in before we We can't see you, that. but we Sure. I will rephrase. Um, you know, why does mindful digital citizenship matter to everyone? Is where I wanted to start. To answer, to answer your question while I, I mess with the, uh, the video, it's really the tragedy of the commons issue that the amount of noise and bad information and unhealthy discourse um, and untrustworthy untru um, code out there, uh, the on only way that you can really improve that is by Im improving the cluefulness of the, of the population who are online. So I'm, I really kept in mind when I wanted to write the book, just be, before I even thought about what was in it, that the, the essence of the real magic of digital networks is that with the right kind of, of social norms, pe people are able to put in a, something and get out a lot more. And that it's actually the cornucopia of the, of the commons. If you, if you know how to do it, and, and that magic has not gone away, but I think has been diluted and lost in a lot of noise because of the, the sheer number of people who don't know what they're doing. And it's not out of particular malevolence, but that they have not been taught. And there's not really a lot of easy ways to learn except from your, your peers. So I thought I would try to make some kind of comprehensive help for people who wanted to, uh, to, to learn more than that they know. And, and again, that's meant to point inward and outward. It's meant to enable people to, to become more uh, effective and successful personally, but also it, it's meant to uh, enable uh, people to improve the, the the online commons for everybody. So I'm going to try to log out and in again and see whether that does me any good. Sorry about On that. On that um, topic, you know, it's those five um, whatever he calls them um, in his book, and attention. Literacies. Yeah. Five literacies, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm math, right? So why would I need to know that word? Um, so one of my favorite quotes that he has in there is when he talks about that it's 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 not drowning um, not drowning is not the same as swimming you know and so not even heading heavy on the crap detection and heavy on the cynicism of it um, he's trying to provide something so our attention gets us to swimming as opposed to just simply not drowning and I, I love that part So when I think about some of my ninth graders, they drown. They just don't know what to do. They're full of everything. They do a, a search and they're overwhelmed. Oh, we can see you, Howard. Yeah. You know, I, I always tell my, my students and, and my co-learners that, that you're not really on the, on the cutting edge of technology if you're not falling off it. So. Um, I just think that you got to patiently mess with it until it works. So right now it's working. So you were saying before I interrupted. And nothing. I was just talking about my ninth graders. They're overwhelmed sometimes by what's out there, what they can do, what they can see. Um, we did a research project not that long ago and your crap detection was just ultimately funny because they do Google searches and then they take the first search and that's law to them and I remind them if we're creating Weeblies and we're creating wikis and we're creating our own websites who's to say that what popped up isn't somebody else's creation and then they sit there for a little while and realize that could be true couldn't it yeah it, it, it could be you know that the information that you're relying on is general and real isn't necessarily general and real you know 
So, you know, I have a collection. I put it in the in the chat and I hang out here, but I have a collection As of websites that, that I use with students um, to show them that not as all as it seems online. And I think going through a lot of the bogus websites is a an eye opener for them. So, you know, when I researched the book, I looked into re research that had been done on how do young people in particular uh, search and there's a frightening percentage. Of Why don't we just start when we see him go out? Someone jump in with a comment or something. So. I I uh, wanted to reflect a little on uh, I, an observation that I began last um, week about the 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 way in which. Um, Howard's experience grows primarily out of working with adults, I believe, either uh, college students or um, other uh, adults. And and I'm I've been, and many of us who just joined through the uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers Network are in the K-12 system, and the the uh, the needs in in terms of how to present these literacies in the K-12 system I think are very different from um, teaching adults and one of the things that, that highlighted that for me in, in reading the introductory um, chapter was um, uh, Howard talking, I'll quote the line, the asymmetry between broadcaster and audience that was dictated by the structure of pre-digital technologies has changed radically. And I think that's true, but not in the K-12 world. <laughs> in uh, you know, the, my, my um, watchword question is, who's telling the computer what to do? And there's a huge opportunity cost with the testing and uh, drill and kill on flashcards that is the majority of use in the majority of ordinary public schools in the US in general I think and I certainly know from personal experience in our local area which is supposed to be the elbow of Silicon Valley and yet that's what kids do they do not get to be respected as creators in relation to their computer use for the most part, especially not at the elementary level. Can't hear you again, Howard, sorry. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, so what, um, if you, you can hear me, so people can hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, weird. This, uh, I, I've never had this happen uh, before exactly like this. So um, I am uh, ignorant of how to, uh, how to change the education system. Um, I, had a, I had a hard time with it myself, and I barely got through it. And if it wasn't for the art teacher, um, who was my mother, um, I wouldn't have gotten through it so uh, my when I it's Fred is true uh, um, Fred is correct that what I've learned is is dealing with young adults uh, you know from I guess at 18 um, and and up and I I think we all agree that this the skills that I'm talking about are not beyond the K through 12 students and are essential to them but there are a number of, of pre pretty strong uh, political uh, conflicts involved. And I think the most important one of them is that in, in order to succeed online, you need to really think critically and question the authority of texts and test the authority of the texts. And it's a problem for a lot of parents and it's a problem for a lot of teachers to have their students and their and their, their children questioning authority all the time. It's not an easy thing <laughs> to do, you know, even if you're committed to it. And then there are a lot of people who think that that is a subversive thing to be teaching our kids, which in fact it is. So, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a fundamental issue and I am actually not 
all that philosophically radical, but I have to think that Ivan Illich w was really right, that school is the problem um, in terms of people learning. But since I don't know how to solve that, what I'm interested in is providing really good resources for those teachers, like the ones in this Hangout, who are just going ahead and pushing ahead. So there's, you know, you can try to change the system by changing the system, or you can just try operating in an entirely new way. And that was, that was what worked with the teachers um, who really saved me from oblivion because I simply could not stand to s sit in a desk all in a row, listening, listening, listening all day long. There's, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's probably beyond the scope of the book here, but can we just all, I'll stipulate that we, we know that, that trying to teach many of the skills, although they are very essential, um, is kind of like swimming upstream in terms of the, the, the parents and the administrations that, that K-12 through teachers have to deal with. Yeah, I think what uh, what the the practitioners in the field are are um, are asking for is our collective use of the tools that you're describing to create those uh, those lessons that will bring th those activities and 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 structures within where wherever you happen to be. I mean, that's the thing about school. It's it's uh, it's horrible, but it's where the kids are. <laughs> for the most part in most places and except for those who have, have the ability to escape so that's why I feel like we have to figure out how to get in there and do this work there so the, the term I wanted to throw out is scaffolding the the uh, it's a term that we use in ESL instruction a lot as uh, and and it, it I think it's an, an important concept in lesson design that is, how can you both create for students a, an environment that's going to lead them in, in a direction that you've decided beforehand you want them to, to go, and yet at the same time have it feel like and in fact be uh, something that incorporates the things that we're trying to get to, that is self-selection and experiential learning and and I I collaboration and, and interactivity so it's it's a very tricky business and I see so often these things that were designed to be scaffolds become ossified in kids minds and the piece of where you clue the kid in hey yeah we did that because we wanted you to get here now you're there you see it forget that stuff and do it on your own that step doesn't happen in most schools because it's so subversive to let kids in on the game well and also I think uh, although again I, I, I'm not going to pose as an expert in, in K-12 education I think with any student starting out as soon as possible by giving them both agency and responsibility in, in some way is a, a, an important signal. I think one of the most interesting things that I'm, I'm going to incorporate in, in my teaching that I've, I saw recently was Kathy Davidson talked about this exercise she does when she's speaking to groups of adults or, or, or when she's speaking to students is, is get, hand out uh, three by five cards and, um, and pens at the very beginning and before she does anything else um, ask people to, to spend uh, 90 seconds writing down what the, they think the three most important questions about the topic are and then um, asking them to break, break up into, into pairs to talk to the person uh, next to them and, um, and try to decide uh, between them what are the um, two most important that they each wrote on their notes again they have 90 seconds and then give them <clears throat> another 90 seconds and have them decide on one and that you know introduces them to the the notion that they that there's there's a collaborative inquiry involved that they're they're starting out with asking the questions 
and and secondly that they have agency before the the teacher starts telling them what they're supposed to be doing they they are are doing it themselves and and thirdly it requires them to um, come to an agreement make arguments about why um, their choices are the are the ones that ought to remain so I, I, I thought that was a tremendous exercise and you don't need to use fancy technology you can use a three by five card or, or, or post-its but I think that that's a an instance of a whole category of activities in which you can I, as a teacher take what emerges in in the direction you would you would have gone if you had just done a lecture and they would have taken notes but actually do it in response to questions that that come from them so I'm when, when I teach my uh, online courses uh, people are taught are, are regarded as co-learners and and collaborative inquiry is really stressed although I do present frameworks and lenses and vocabularies about the subject which I know a lot about I'm making it clear that within the, those frameworks we are all depending on each other to try to to ask the right questions and with my facilitation start finding ways to answer them Howard along those lines um, you know the five literacies in your book and things that Fred brought up to me those all you learn them best by doing and um, so I'm, I'm thinking in in the K through 12 classroom any place but specifically in there we don't have enough time to be doing some of those things so I'm leading now into your pedagogy um, and thinking that maybe sharing just a bit about that will help kind of like Kathy's idea to me um, help people see how maybe they can free up some time in the classroom by doing things like the peer-to-peer -peer learning isn't that what show and tell is when it's when it's done best and isn't show and tell one of the when you remember what was fun in school isn't that what what kind of pops up they give you a chance right. I think uh, why not um, on some scale in, in enable and make students responsible for doing a little bit of the teaching you know, go Hello. go this is this is a B and C I want you to go home and work Hello. on D E and F and come back and teach the rest of us about it and someone else will do G H and I um, maybe that works maybe it doesn't work maybe you, you have to have to do it another way later but I, I just think that the experiment of enabling people to begin teaching each other is so important it's just, I mean I think it's important to the way people learn I think it's particularly important in terms of these digital literacies that I make I make the distinction between a skill and uh, and the traditional uh, definition of literacy is the skill of encoding and de decoding in a uh, in a medium you know knowing how to read and, and write but all of the skills that I, I talk about in that smart attention participation collaboration craft detection network awareness they all have a social component that have to do with knowing how to use that encoding and and decoding skill in concert with others and, and I think that there's a radical change from the the broadcast era in that you had to maybe someday you would be a a, a a journalist or a news broadcaster or an entertainer and and people would see you on the big screen or the little screen but now we're in a world where everybody is a participant whether they you know actually whether they like it or not they're they are going to be tagged they're going to be searchable they're going to be in that that digital world so learning how to participate is essential and you know, and if you followed some of the, the blogging that I did for DML Central, you'll see that that um, I, I I found people um, all over the place who are teaching fifth and sixth graders who are to blog or or use wikis. It's not that do, enabling young students to participate in the World Wide Web is unknown. It's not unknown. People are 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 doing it with tremendous results. Well, I, 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 I am not a teacher, I'm a student, um, but I think that all the things have you mentioned 
about knowledge and about how you broadcast or create the knowledge in a collaborative way. It's, it's very important and for us it's better than the teacher talk, talk and talk uh, and we, we have a better experience when the knowledge is built by by in groups in groups of students and uh, sorry about my, my English uh, I, I read a book called macroeconomics and it is about how the people in the world can collaborate and can create things really great and I, I recommend you and I think this book can be so great for and um, for give you ideas to give a better experience to the students through the web. And Absolutely, there are so there are so many ways that a student can collaborate online and can participate in real scientific research, find communities of people who share their interests, so many different things that, that there's, there's not really an age limit on. Um, you know, you've got crowdsourcing and collective intelligence and virtual communities and, and smart mobs and social production, so many different genres of collaboration that just weren't even possible before. And, you know, I, in, in the book, I, I start out the participation chapter by talking about Heather Lover, who organized a worldwide boycott of the Warner Brothers uh, because their attorneys had shut down, uh, attempted to shut down a Harry Potter fa fan site. And the attorneys um, who backed off their, their um, uh, attempt to shut down the site, they, they didn't even realize that she was 16 years old. And, you know, we're seeing yeah, very, very young people doing pretty, pretty powerful things in the world out there. And what kind of difference does it make to you, no, no matter what your, your setting is, if you see yourself as someone who can affect people on the other side of the world, rather than, you know, I'm in, in my little place here and I'm going to watch the, the, the broadcast from the people who are living their real lives. Um, just the example of w Wikipedia in your book, Howard, uh, about how, you know, like a lot of teachers, at least the ones that I interact with, a lot of them uh, tell their students, you know, don't use Wikipedia. Stay away from Wikipedia. You can't trust Wikipedia. So you talked about a teacher, and, and I, th I think some of us probably have, um, you know, getting students to edit Wikipedia is a pretty powerful um, lead into that kind of thinking. There are, of course, um, it's not as easy to edit Wikipedia as it, as it was a few years ago, but the power the, the, uh, of being able to create or, or improve a, a page in an encyclopedia, the you know, knowledge that people all over the world are going to use, how, how amazingly powerful is that as a, a teaching lesson? The, the, the example that I cited was one that I, I got from Henry Jenkins, who had uh, talked to a teacher who's whose class had, had did something about um, improving the Wikipedia page on Moby Dick. You know, this is not, just, not uh, it's a non-trivial uh, piece of, of knowledge. So, I, you know, I don't think that Wikipedia is the end of it. And certainly, kind of the, the superficial approach to Wikipedia is to tell students to avoid it because it's unreliable, but, uh, you know, I think there's nothing uh, as the, that teacher who taught uh, Moby Dick said, there's nothing like looking at the talk page and seeing how people decided what was going to go on this, and then argue with them and, and win and have you know your material included. That's just a wholly different thing from thinking that there's some learned encyclopedia writer out there who creates knowledge and, and we're going to try to t take our notes on it. It's just a, just a different way of viewing yourself in the world. And, I, and, and that's what's really, I think, in, in important in all, all of this mindful digital citizenship is about becoming awake 
to the, the power that you have and, 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 and using that, you know, not only for yourself, but, but for other people as well. And I, you know, I think that's a very powerful narrative and that the, the narrative that there are a few people in Hollywood who create the dreams that everybody else has to pay for is um, a disempowering narrative to a lot of people in the world. And now we've got this uh, medium that, does, that it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a star, it doesn't guarantee that everybody's going to listen to you, but if you know what you're doing, you can do things that just weren't possible for students before. And about empowering people, I think that great educational initiatives like the, the release of the site today that is a, a collaborative way uh, between the MIT and Harvard. Uh, I don't know if you heard the notice, the new, that they they will bring a new site where they will publish all the material course and educational ways to learn all about MIT and Harvard. I think that will empower all all the world. I, I, I imagine all the billions of people knowing uh, what are teaching in the best universities of the world that that will change the mind and not an individual mind but a collective mind to bring the humanity forward yeah exactly I mean we've got big big problems uh, humans do and our greatest assets are, are, are the seven billion people and um, with those seven billion pe people I think there are something like more than five billion mobile phones two billion people on the the internet if those people could have access to to learning that um, that they did not have access to before think of what we could do together and, and I think it's important to note that most of what we regard as personal computing and digital networks today were invented by people who specifically had that in mind that they wanted to create tools that would help people everywhere in the world um, uh, solve problems together <laughs> yeah that, that would be awesome I, I have this uh, memory of a period in the uh, in the late 90s when the commercialization of the web really uh, took off and and I felt resentful <laughs> I felt like this this collegial uh, basically academic but certainly communitarian um, environment that I had loved so much had been destroyed by commercialism and it took several years to sort of get, D figure out ways to deal with that uh, presence on the web. It's it's uh, it's a continuing challenge. Well, the, the web is like the web is like yeah. the world. The only thing I, I I see as a problem is it's the government. You know, uh, the USA and the great. Uh, countries around the world are restricting the collaborative ways in that people talking and people share their knowledge and I don't know I think uh, political movements like CISPA or here in Colombia uh, sorry or here in Colombia uh, a legal way called the Ley Geras it's restricting the people to be collaborative, to share their knowledge, and I see that like a, as a as a threat to to educational empowering of people, especially in the poor countries. Uh, here in Colombia, we are we are in some way. Uh, under the government of United States, so the legisl the legislation, I, I don't know how to say it, the legal ways are are going to all the countries, and I think if that that not have 
are real, I don't know, business or corporation or the unity of people that paint a face to that, I, I think the all empowering of people in, in educational ways will be trained in a big, big and dangerous way. And all initiatives, of course, can be can be got down. Did someone have a question for me about the book? Yeah, good, good point. Um, Howard, I I have one. Um, I um, digital citizenship is something that I spend very little time in my classroom on, um, because what it has become to mean is um, is kind of policing kids, you know. And, and, and I even worry that some of the pages of your book could be photocopied and used to like, you know, that list of, of bad websites and here are, all the, here are all the dangerous things you want to stay away from on the web. Um, I don't know if you follow my drift at all. I, I just, we, we started a, an interesting conversation last week around Coney 2012, for example, um, where it's not like, the sites around Coney 2012 were not crap. The, the story was not crap. It was, it was also not wonderful. It was very complicated. Um, and so I guess when kids are involved in researching things that they're passionate about, do they need to worry about all the rules of digital citizenship? It's about imposing rules on kids too often in schools. Does it, do you hear a question there, or can I? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not. Yeah. I'm. I'm not. I'm not big on on policing. Um, I, I know, but yeah. But I, and and if you if you look at um, Eleanor Ostrom's work, who who won the Nobel Prize last year for talking about institutions for collective action, her her empirical research of all kinds of people trying to do things together, either from water sharing or or um, shared forest resources or 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 fishing um, every time um, norms that are agreed upon by groups of people uh, among themselves are far more likely to to be observed than rules that are uh, applied from the outside so again it's subversive but you know I think it's a in terms of, I think what you're talking about, di digital citizenship, like ethics of remix, for example, I think mm -hmm. it's really important to think about these polar conflicts between incentive for individuals who invent things and the commons in which art and science and scholarship and education depend on remixing and building upon work that other people do so the I don't I don't think it's so much um, in its essence a matter of rules as a matter of understanding what these um, conflicting claims are and thinking to yourself do I want to rip this person off or um, do I want to to you know put the URL on my slide so that people will know where I got it um, do I want to search through um, Creative Commons images uh, for those that people have given me permission to use, or um, is this fair use? And it's for educational and, and scholarly purposes, and I have a right to use it. Yeah. I think being able to think about those things, knowing that, and knowing that there is a, a a social conflict around them, is important. Yeah, I, you uh, know what? I, I, I think teacher who's got to deal with this stuff at a K through twelve level because there's a lot yeah. of simplistic thinking about that. Exactly. I, I think so. I think I can ask my question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but so like so much of the curriculum is in, in too many places is taken up with dealing with those more abstract issues rather than going and doing the remixing. <laughs> you know, um, if you're if you're involved in participating, issues are going to come up. Yeah. But I'm not sure we need a class or a time even to deal with the ab those issues in the abstract. I think we have to deal with them when they when they happen. That's so. That's that's my worry about uh, digital um, citizenship curriculum, that people will teach that and think that their kids are actually participating, and they're not. They're just talking about it. 
we wouldn't be sitting here talking about the web if if millions of people had not decided to participate. It's a a participatory yeah. medium at its best, and there certainly are forces that are trying to turn it into back into a broadcast medium. And again, my answer to that is to increase the number of people who know that they could create something, that they could they could make the next Google in their their dorm room. They could be Heather Lover. That they're give them lots of examples of. You know, people who have done things because they knew what they were doing. They didn't have to ask permission. They didn't have to rewire anything. They just had, you know, internet access in their dormitory room, and they were able to think about it, and they they changed things. I think those are those are extremely powerful narratives. The narratives that um, I I had growing up were not about young people having tremendous economic and 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 political power. There's a there's a line from uh, your introduction that I want to quote. Um, I see the outlines of a new narrative emerging, however, in which competition is still central, but its place on our mental map shrinks a little to make room for new knowledge about cooperative arrangements and complex interdependencies. And I noted that just because, I, for the sake of argument, <laughs> Um, I feel like it, it's just way too weak a statement of the case that in fact the the collaborative and um, uh, cooperative venture is fundamentally opposed to that competitive model that is that is is trying to dominate and prevent that collaboration from taking place so it's it's a Again, I'm being the radical and provocateur here, but um, well, well, Fred, um, this is another an entirely um, uh, a conversation of of its own. But uh, as you know, I spent a certain amount of time looking at the dynamics of of uh, cooperation, and it, it and it's becoming more and more clear to me that, in the largest sense, from from the emergence of life uh, itself um, to um, human intelligence and and um, and, and human in institutions, that we have this dual nature, the, the dual nature that our 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 religions and our our stories talk about. We are um, animals, and we are more than animals, and we are incredibly cruel and. Um, effective uh, predators, and we are the most uh, cooperative and collaborative uh, species that existed. And that, in fact, the, the way th these capac human capacities have emerged, and the way they always work, is through a conflict. Be be it's the social dilemma. It's the I've got to look out for myself, um, and I've got to join in with others in collective action. And that's a there's a there's a whole complex set of social norms and institutions that we've created to kind of to to work around our um, very recent um, uh, predator past and to try to try to become something that's that's not just um, uh, a predator. But I, I think that that uh, you can't leave. Uh, competition in its in its, its most, most brutal form out of the equation when you're talking about humans but I also think that's you know that's the way it evolved it's um, it's let it's let you and I cooperate against them over there and that has been a tremendous driver um, we don't have any them over there um, anymore we, we, we've have populated the sphere so we you know we need to to jump to another level, but again, referring back to Ostrom, she says that people are only prisoners of the prisoner's dilemma. They're only um, locked into mistrust of each other if they choose to, to to be so. That there are lots of ways that we learn to trust each other and we learn to to operate together and um, and perform effective collective action. And I think th th learning how to do that is is maybe the one of the the single most um, important things that we could be doing um, right now and that 
compared to how important it is, the amount of knowledge that we really have about how people cooperate and fail to, to cooperate um, uh, is uh, equivalent to what we knew about disease before we, we realized that they were caused by microorganisms. Jeff, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask or get involved in here? Oh, I have lots of questions. That was Brad we have Pitt. to be out of this room in about two minutes, so um, I think I'll hold them okay. for the follow-up webcast. So, Howard, do you want to say Sorry anything in closing? We have two minutes till we're checking out, and so you'll you'll be the spokesperson for all of us in this close. I will say I, the book is a, a great read. Um, I, if you haven't read it yet, I'd get it. Net Smart. Thank, thanks so much. And I I can only say that there are there's no major media on this yet. There are no major reviews on this yet. I'm really depending on word of mouth and it was really created for uh, for teaching so um, spread the word I'll add his comment about um, Tim Berners-Lee saying that you know he didn't want to own the web he wanted it to be useful and so that's another plug for NetSpark to me it's teaching you how to how to live and to be useful as opposed to um, you know, just gain knowledge or content, um, so that exponentiality that we're afforded. Go ahead, Paul. I'm good. I don't know. Do you um, take out? Some, somehow uh, we got some public people in here, folks, so I don't know how that happened. But, uh, sorry about that tonight. Um, do my takeout? Um, I don't know. Uh, my takeout. I, I, I'd love to keep talking. Um, we, there are other issues um, that we can keep uh, going to um, other other weeks. Um, I, Fred, do you want to? Do you want to? Um, I think it'd be fun actually if you'll give us a a precast of what you plan to do next week. You're gonna oh sure play games with yeah us. I'd love to actually. Uh, um, Thanks, Howard. I I thought about when when Howard brought up the. Uh, there's a wonderful quote that I will will try to actually edit into a clip and share next week from a, a discussion that uh, Howard facilitated on connected learning about the the, the, the five elements of game-based learning and and the way I teach string games is really game-based learning the I it's cat's cradle the the uh, and it's a it's a human universal and as an anthropologist I, I always have I, I played string games as a kid, but I studied them as an anthropologist, and I love the way in which string connects a global culture, and um, the the process of kids learning string games in in this way that I've developed to teach them is a, a, a wonderful exemplar of this kind of of game based learning. Because when I teach a figure, there, there, I always start with, with, uh, almost always start with the very simplest figure about three moves, and there's usually three or four kids who get it right away, and then I immediately designate them as teachers. And when I had a long-term second-grade classroom, our motto was, "We're all teachers in this classroom," because everyone had learned something in the string that they could share with someone else. And it brought in the community because I had them go home and talk to their parents and grandparents and, and bring string from the And I tried to add a digital dimension to it, but it, that, that part um, was the hardest to make happen so, because so we'll of the help restrictions. You. So we'll help you think about that. Maybe they won't, we yeah. won't have the same kind of restrictions. I'm going to try and rehearse to actually do a little demo lesson against a white wall of, of uh, how to do this simple figure that I start with. All right. Howard, thank you for the note. note. Bring a six-foot piece of string next week. Good thank point. You, okay, Howard. so we'll make sure that happens. Yeah. Howard, I wanted to say thank you for the uh, show-and-tell notion, too. And I think what, what, um, what Fred's going to be doing next week is really show-and-tell. It's uh, show-and-tell of something he's excited about. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Um, I know the string games are something that people do all over the world. So thanks, thanks for being interested in the book. Um, hope, hope somebody out there learned something.
Thank you so it's much. It's been chaotic fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll yeah, see you. I'll see you all. I'm being called to dinner pretty soon. Thank you, Jeff. We good? Bye -bye. That was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Good night.